All right, so next we're going to prove a result that was promised in the previous section, and we're going to prove the p-test. We'll do it in general. Of course, you can set a equal to 1, b equal to 0, and get the regular p-test. Uh, but we'll, we'll do the general version, because of course, that if we prove it in general, it's going to apply the, to the special case as well. Um, one thing that we should probably require, though, I think, just to, well, certainly I think we should specify that a is positive. Um, if a is equal to 0, then this is just, these are just constants, and then we're adding up a constant, and it's going to diverge, right? So we need a to be positive. Um, if a was negative, well, you could factor the minus sign out. You get a minus 1 to the p. It's either plus or minus, right? It's constant multiple. We don't worry about that. Um, and also, just to simplify things for us, let's assume that b is bigger than or equal to 0, OK? We'll assume that as well. Because if b is, if b is negative, then, then we introduce the possibility that there might be a 0 in the denominator for some value of n. Um, and even, even if that 0 in the denominator doesn't occur at an integer, even if it occurs at some rational value, or I mean, these could be real numbers, right? It could be some real number value. Um, it would still be the case that there's a vertical asymptote somewhere, right? Um, and if that vertical asymptote occurs somewhere between, like, let's say it occurs between n equals 5 and n equals 6 or something like that, um, well, we won't have a positive decreasing function until we cross the vertical asymptote. So we can handle that. We just modify things, right? A finite number of terms doesn't affect convergence. We can always start at some other value. But just to keep life simple, assume that b is bigger than or equal to 0, um, so we don't have to worry about an asymptote. Okay? At least we don't have to worry about an asymptote that happens for positive values of n, right? Okay, very good. So with that in place, basic graph transformations should tell you what this thing looks like, right? The graph of, um, let's see, so what are we going to do? Well, first of all, our a n, a sub n, looks like 1 over a n a times n plus b to the power of p, right? And so that is equal to f of n for a function f of x given by 1 over ax plus b to the p, okay? And that's just some transformed version of 1 over x to the p. And 1 over x to the p, assuming that p is positive here, right, typically is going to look like that, right? Um, this half will either be here or there, depending on whether p is odd or even. Get something that looks like that. So we, we get the positive decreasing function that we're supposed to have. So we look at the integral. We say, OK, what do we get? Do the indefinite integral first. So 1 over ax plus b to the power p integrate with respect to x. Okay? Um, now, we know that if, um, if p is equal to 1, well, then we get this is going to give me 1 over a times the natural log of ax plus b. And we know that as x goes to infinity, that's going to blow up on us, OK? So we know it diverges if p is equal to 1. So we're going to assume here assume that p is not equal to 1. Well, if p is not equal to 1, then this is just power rule, right? power rule and chain rule. So that is, so this is the integral of ax plus b to the minus p. We add 1 to the exponent, so we get uh, minus p plus 1, 1 minus p. We drop that into the denominator, that's going to be ax plus b to the p minus 1, 1 over that. Um, 
Oh, but we also have to divide by a, right? There's a 1 over a coming from the chain rule. So there's an extra a out there. Okay. Plus your c if you like. Okay. And so if we're looking at the improper integral, so going from 1 to infinity, 1 over ax plus b to the p dx, okay? Well, we're going to get the limit as n goes to infinity, 1 over a times 1 over Oh, we also have to divide by, we have to divide by the new exponent, right? Forgot that. Ha, ha, ha. Um, so we also have a p minus 1 in there, or maybe minus 1 plus p. So we also have that. Um, all right, yeah. So we have that. We have minus p plus 1. We have 1 over ax plus b to the p minus 1. There's our, or sorry, n. I guess I called it n. There we go. Um, minus the lower limit, if we plug in 1, what do we get at the lower limit? We put in x equal to 1. We get, uh, you know, some constant, right? Minus, we get uh, 1 over a times a plus b times 1 minus p. It's a constant. Um, and so we look at this and we say, yeah, this, this here limit, um, what can we say about it? This limit is going to be equal to zero as long as p minus one is positive, and it's going to be equal to infinity if p minus one is negative, right? We've already ruled out the p is equal to one case. Um, okay, so it's going to converge if p minus 1 is positive, which is the same thing as saying that p is bigger than 1, which is what we had here, right? And if and only if, because if p is not bigger than 1, then either um, it's equal to 1, and we know it diverges, or it's less than 1, and we know it diverges, okay? So either way, we know that we have a convergent improper integral if p is bigger than 1, and so... Correspondingly, we have a convergent p-series if p is bigger than 1.